Well, here we go. It is the last week of our Act of Fool series. It has been 13 weeks since the beginning of this message series that we have finally gotten through. And uh, man, what a journey it has been. We've talked about all kinds of fun stuff, uh, exciting stuff, challenging stuff, hard stuff. And uh, today I've been saving this message for the final act of Act of Fool. I guess that's the way, the way to put it. Um, and so I'm going to take us over to Romans chapter 3, verses 23 through to 25. And uh, this is, this is going to be a fun little, like, I feel like we got like this little studio audience happening right now. Um, and so you're going to see me interact. I don't know how this is actually going to come across this weekend since no one's actually here except us 20. So there you go. Here's what really happened. We all wanted to have a throwback to the beginning of COVID. So... <laughs> I probably shouldn't say those things, but there you go. So hopefully uh, all of you joining in online today or catching this afterwards, uh, have a little fun with this because I'm horrible at uh, these things like this. So uh, I'm just going to do it the way that I want to do it today. And if I, break, if I break the fourth wall, for those of you who understand what that means, um, well, then there you go. <laughs> Romans chapter 3, verses 23 through to 25. And this is what it says. This is Paul the Apostle speaking to the church at Rome. And he says, for all have sinned. Come on, somebody. That's a hard part of the scripture. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Thanks, Paul, for the encouraging moment. And he says, and are justified. Here's the good part, though. We're justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a, here's the big Bible word, propitiation by his blood to be received by Faith. There's so much in here that we can get into, but this is, this is the part I want to look at. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but we're justified by his grace as a gift. So today as we close out this series, Act a Fool, I want to speak to you from the subject, Another Way to Fail. Another Way to Fail. As we look at using wisdom to deal with failure. We pray with me just one more time today. Jesus, we love you. Your word is blessed. And your word is powerful. And so, God, right now, I pray that the power of your word would bring freedom to our lives. And so I just thank you, God, for this, hopefully, what is a freeing ending to this series for all of us watching today. So we love you. We honor you. May these be your words, not my words. We give it over to you in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, and everybody said amen. amen. Uh, here, here's the truth that I think... We can all, with grand honesty, grapple with today and be very, very aware of today's that we all fail. Fair? We all fail. We all mess up. All 20 of us in here. Uh, <laughs> we've jacked it up many times. And here's the truth. Like, you've, you've messed it up many times. I've messed it up many times. I, I was trying to think of a, an illustration for failure, um, and then I started to realize I have way too many of them. So... Um, <laughs> So I really, I don't have a story that I want to even like enlighten you with to, to set this point up is that we all fail. We, we all mess up. We all do things, whether, whether it's on purpose or on accident. We'll talk, we'll talk about that in a minute. But we all fall short of this place that we all seem to want to be at, which is interesting is that place is perfection, but God doesn't require it of us. You know what's really interesting about this whole thing about failure and, and, and not messing up is that God never requires perfection from us, but we do. So it's interesting that we require from ourselves something that God does not require of us. It's interesting to me that we tend to require something for ourselves that Jesus died for. That he created a gift that says, by my grace, 
You don't have to be perfect if you would just rest in me. The problem with failure is that it continues to push us to perfection. The reality is that you and I mess up. We all fail, we all fall short. And it's in this particular piece of scripture that we realize that Paul is addressing two specific truths that we need to understand in reference to failure. First of all, every single one of us, no matter who we are, where we come from, our family background, our IQ, our temperament, or your Enneagram number, every single one of us (laughs) sin. However, if you are an eight, you really do believe that you're perfect. We understand, okay? (laughs) We get it. We get it. The truth is we're broken. The clean theological term would be total depravity. We've all messed up. Like from the, from the baseline, we're, we're messed up. Meaning that we are inherently in need of a savior. One who can rescue us. Second, it's that every single one of us falls short of God's glory. Meaning that we're not perfect, we lack. Glory cannot be ascribed to any single one of us because we're not deserving of it or capable of anything that should be be or demand glory in our name. Now this is a really important truth for us to grab a hold of because we live in a culture that props a lot of people up to the place where glory should be ascribed to them, don't we? We live, in, we live in a time, we live in an age that we, we ascribe glory to, to movie stars and, and musicians and brilliant people and people with lots of money and you, you fill in the gaps. But the truth is this, is that as, as, as a humanity as a whole, none of us are deserving of God's glory because we can't have it. One of the base reasons that we can't have it is because we're not capable of holding that type of glory. We're not capable of handling that type of weight. That's the beautiful thing about God. The only one who's who's able to handle the weight of glory is God. That's why we ascribe glory to him. So that's why Paul's like, hey, let me just be really sure. That's why this is such a positive verse for us. Let me just get this out of the way for you guys. Not only are you not perfect, you can't handle glory. So let's just keep it straight. That's what I love about Paul. He just is, he's real on it, right? One author put it this way. The righteousness God provides has its origin in what God did, not what people may accomplish. So for those of us at a base level today who are joining in for the first time and we potentially believe that we have to earn God's love and and earn eternity through our works and through our stuff and the way that we do things, it's right here where we learn that none of that is possible. Because at the end of the day, the righteousness that is ascribed to you and me only comes through Jesus. The good news is we have a savior, one who, as Paul would go on to say, justified us by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, when we fail, the game's not over. It has not ended. Another way we can look at it is like this. Failure is a detour, not a dead-end street. But don't we allow failure to stop us from walking? We allow failure to stop us from continuing on. So many times we allow failure to stop us from doing all that God has called us to. Every single one of us. We've got to realize that because we are human, we're going to mess up. We're going to fail. And and, and let's be very clear about this. Failure is not just sin. Like that's one one portion of it, for sure. But what I've found many times is that it's not sin that stops us from moving on. It's what we deem as stronger than sin that keeps us from moving on. Let me explain it this way. We have the worship teams in here right now because they had to worship with you. (laughs) And then the rest of them had to watch. So (laughs) it's awesome. Um, But Devon, let's let's pick pick on Devon right here. he's He's an amazing singer, an amazing worship leader. And what I've found interesting is that many times it, it's not sin that would stop, from, stop Devon from pursuing everything that God has for him. It's him hitting too many bad notes. Think about that. Most of the time we can actually work with the, the sin that we've found ourselves in. It's this other thing that we think we're producing. Talent, skill, 
And so it's actually not the sin that he would engage in that would stop him. It's what he believes he messed up at that he gets a complex over. He gets insecure over. I found most of us actually don't get insecure with the failure that is attached to sin. We get insecure with the failure that's attached to who we think we should be. So I need us to understand there's, there's many, many facets of failure. So we have to become the type of people that don't allow failure to stop us from continuing into and continuing on to grab a hold of what God has for us. Failure is a part of life, but failure is not the end. Failure is not falling down, but rather refusing to get back up. All right, success in life comes from having a healthy perspective and response to failure. See, when we have failure that is attached to sin, we have this beautiful word called repentance. And it's interesting is that many of us will willingly repent. But I've found that one of the greater issues that we face is very few of us are willing to face the insecurities that came with other types of failure. Is it possible that our pride attached to what we think we should be better at is more powerful than the sin that we find ourselves entangled in? Something to just mess around with on this beautiful 4th of July weekend. So why why is failure such a big deal? Because there's a part in every single one of us, listen to this, this is important. Why is failure a big deal? Because there's a part in every single one of us that has the desire to please. There's a part of every single one of us that has the desire to be everything we know that we can be. And we fail, when we fail, Not only do we let ourselves down, but we also feel like we let everyone around us down. So I've come to realize that most people base their failure out of two different categories. Here's the first category, real failure. Like real failure. This failure is true and legitimate failure. Its premise, a willingness to disobey and or act according to one's own sinful desires. We call this sin. It's a legitimate failure. It's real. Sinful desires being those desires that stand at odds and rebellion against God's desires for your life and my life. James chapter one, verses 14 through 15 teaches us this. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. So the first category is real failure. That is, that's pretty clear for every single one of them. But here's the second category. It's imaginary failure. This failure, a lot of times, is the result of the strict obligations. Hear this today, because this is going to set some people free. Strict obligations and standards that we place upon ourselves outside of God's intended desire for our lives. In other words, these are the things we put on ourselves that God never put on us. So what we then try to do is we try to balance it by overcompensating with stubborn passion for success and achievement. We call this legalism. Or we go to the other extreme, and we call this lawlessness. Paul deals with both these issues in the book of Galatians. More scripture, Galatians 2, 15 through 16. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not, here it is, that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Galatians chapter five, verse one. Here it is. This is like a 4th of July weekend verse for you. (laughs) For freedom! (laughs) Christ has set us free. So watch what he says. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Galatians 5.13 continues on. For you were called, oh, I love this verse, you were called to freedom. If you are ever wondering like what your calling is, it's not a, it, it's not a vocation, that's a, little, that, that's a little space that we can get down with. But if you wanna know what your calling is, you were called to freedom. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. My imperfections, someone said it like this, my imperfections and failures 
are as much a blessing from God as my successes and my talents, and I lay them both at his feet. So here's the, here's the thing I want to mess with today. We need to learn to take joy in the failures of life. Am I, am I submitting to us we take fail, like we take joy in our sin? No. That's real failure. But we should take joy in repentance. But we also should take joy in the fact that our failures should produce a reality in us when it's imaginary failures that help us realize all of a sudden, wait a second, I'm not meant to be perfect. You're going to hit a bad note, Devon. Right? You're going to play a bad chord, Danny. Seth is going to mess up the rhythm all the time. <laughs> we need to learn how to be content in all things, yet at the same time, being a people who are forward thinking, forward progressing, and live lives to the glory of our King. So, there are many ways that we can do this, but, but today... As we close out this Active Fool series, and I really hope this series has been something that has blessed you, has encouraged you, strengthened you, given you something to wrestle with that maybe you haven't wrestled with before. What I want to do today is I want to give you three principles for what I call failing with wisdom. How to fail with wisdom. Here we go. Here's the first one. These are going to be super simple, all right? Elementary almost, but it's amazing how often we don't employ them in our lives. Here's the first one. Quit looking back. Quit looking back. In the, in the book of Genesis, in the 19th chapter, we find the story and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a failed city. All, all kinds of different things happening within this city. It was, in, in effect, a city of, of sin. It was filled with all kinds of wickedness, and there's some things that God did not like so much about this city. In essence, it was a city that had failed, and in, in, in this term, it wasn't an imaginary failure. It was, it was just pretty messed up. So God decides, and I don't want to get into all the tenets of what we feel about God in these things, but at least here in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 19, God decides we've got to like redo this, so I'm taking the city out. And there's a lot more to, the, to this story, but I want to just focus on one part of it. And so here we, here we have people starting to escape the city in one particular woman, Lot's wife. In Genesis chapter 19, verse 26, as they're exiting the city, to escape from it, this is what it says, but his wife looked back behind him and she became a pillar of salt. And what we see right here is that she looked back. And if I can just take a metaphorical approach, a principalized approach at this particular piece of scripture, I think this is what looking back does to many of us. When we look back, we stay stuck in the past. When we look backwards all the time, we have a tendency to get stuck in what was rather than what God has. And that's what I'm saying. There's a lot of different things that are, that are, that are surrounding this particular uh, uh, piece of Scripture. And I'm not saying that God's going to turn any of us into a pillar of assault. That is not the... That is not what I'm getting at. What I'm trying to get us to understand, though, is I have witnessed firsthand what happens when we decide, when we see God trying to bring us into something and we decide to look back. Have you ever noticed that the rear view mirror of a car is a whole lot smaller than the windshield? There's a reason for that. And the reason is you cannot drive forward looking in the rear view. The truth is, is that many of us can look at our marriages and we can go, it's, it's failed. But I wonder if your view of failure on your marriage is because we're too busy looking at all the other things instead of realizing there's still a windshield to my marriage. Maybe you're tripped up because you keep on looking back at how many times you've relapsed in that addiction. It's rear view looking. I just need you to know today that it's for freedom. God's called you to freedom. That is the windshield of our faith. And while we're still so busy looking at the rear view mirror, I need us to understand today, come on somebody, that there is a windshield to our faith. So we gotta quit looking back. We look back and allow all the screw-ups and mishaps to be right there in our face when really there is a 
great horizon ahead of us. In a sense, we become a pillar of salt, frozen, stuck, hardened in a way that doesn't enable us to to move forward. Here's the truth that I found about the rearview mirror is that it should teach us about our mistakes but not keep us in them. It should teach us about our mistakes but not keep us in them. Learn, grow, but allow God to wipe the slate clean so that he can build something new and beautiful in your life. We can be the type of people that can always be forward looking. I'm not, I'm not asking any of us to like fake that stuff didn't happen in the past. I'm not asking any of us to ignore the things that we might have, be hung up over, have issues in. What I'm simply saying is like, hey, realize, notice that you don't look backwards to get in the rear view mirror. You just glance up really quick, make sure like, oh, yep, that thing's behind me, but I'm still looking forward. Right? Many times I just look up in my rear view mirror to make sure that when I'm making an adjustment or making a move, there's not something there that's in my blind spot that's gonna bring me back or take me out or destroy me because I gotta keep looking forward. I gotta keep driving forward. I gotta keep moving to the destination that is ahead of me. And so the first way to fail with wisdom is quit looking back. Here's the, here's the second thing. Accept the consequences Accept the consequences. It is amazing how hard this is for us. Come on, like, I'm not going to have anybody raise their hands because there's only like 20 of us in here, so y'all get called out. (laughs) But in the house and online today, how many of us, like truthfully speaking, it is a hard reality to just be like, I accept the consequences. (laughs) Right? Like, you even got to mumble it. Like, I just... Here's, the pro- here's why we struggle with accepting consequences. We struggle with accepting consequences because it's the acknowledgement that we did something wrong. That's why. It's not even because we're bothered by the consequence. It's just that we did something wrong. I have been pulled over for speeding a few times. <laughs> right? And the funny thing was, I, I surprised a cop once after he pulled me over because he's like, do you know why I pulled you over? And I said, absolutely. I was speeding like a madman. <laughs> and he looked at me. He's like, wow. I mean, thanks for being truthful. <laughs> On that merit, go about your merry way. <laughs> I was like, all right, cool. I like this truth thing. But what happens is, is in any segment, like we're teaching our kids right now. No, 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 no. Just like accept the consequences. Don't, don't fight us on this. Because it makes it worse. It makes the situation more difficult. We've got to learn. One of the greatest, like, where healing comes from many times is the acceptance of the consequences of our failure. We actually don't learn from our failures when we relegate the consequences as far away from us as possible. Real growth. If you want to know how you really grow through failure is actually accept that you messed it up. Except the fact that, that those words actually came out of your mouth. Right. You said those things. It wasn't something else. The devil didn't make you do it. <laughs> you said it. You did it. I did it. I said it. We've got to learn to accept it. One of the most beautiful and hard stories in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 19 through to 23. This is the backside to David's adulterous affair with Bathsheba. And it says this. It says, but when David saw that his servant was whispering together, his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. So what had happened was, is after this illicit affair, God tells David, hey, there's going to be some consequences. And this is a hard story because when we read the story, we do not like the consequences, all right? So chapter, nine, or chapter 12, verses 19 through to 23, but when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead, and the repercussions of his sin was the death of this child. And David said to his servants, is the child dead? They said, he is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went to the house of the Lord and worshiped. He then went into his own house 
And when he asked, they set food before him and he ate. Then his servants said to him, because they thought this was weird behavior as well, what is this thing that you have done? You have fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. So David's, put, like, he's, he's going to God saying, God, please don't do this, please don't do this, please don't do this. And he said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and I wept, for I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me, that the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. The problem with this scripture is that there's not an equalizing part on the backside of it. There's no part that helps us with our emotions about it. There's no part that we're like, and David was then happy. <laughs> no. Because let's be truthful about it. Facing the consequences is often difficult. It's often difficult. David realized that he had failed. He knew there were going to be consequences. Now, in the Old Testament, God dealt with a lot of issues and failures by wiping people out, putting people through massive trials and circumstances. And I know that's something for some of us that we have a hard time reconciling, and that's a whole different series. On the Old Testament, join LDP. You'll learn all about it. It's great. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> because of God's goodness, he sends the ultimate sacrifice. He gave his one and only son. Now, this does not mean, right, that we are now invincible from consequence. There is natural consequences to the things that we do in life. And so we have to understand that part of growth, part of like, de like wise dealings with failure is actually learning to accept the consequences. And I just want to help us out with that because I think one of the things that we're, we're dealing with in our culture right now is that many of us are consequence adverse and therefore we try to push off anything that makes us feel some sort of way about the wrong that we did. Am I, help am I helping anybody? We feel, and here's the truth, we feel shame because of our failure, but we shouldn't wear shame. We feel guilt because of our failure, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't let that be a part of who we are. When we accept the consequence, we say, okay, God, I, I am taking on that which I caused, but I know that this does not make me who I am, and it does not speak to who I am. Ultimately, it is you who speaks to who I am. So when we fail, we just learn, like, man, I messed that up. It's amazing how far sorry we'll go. Like, I can't be mad if I get pulled over by a police officer for speeding and he gives me a ticket. It's the natural consequence. We all learned that at the DMV. <laughs> or some of us didn't, and that's why we do it. So, <laughs> right? Like, I can't get angry because the consequence of speaking a certain way to my wife, say, makes her mad at me. I can't go at her and be like, why are you mad at me? She's like, well, you just said some things. It's the consequence. So I can't be frustrated that there's now dissonance in our relationship. And the problem that we're facing right now is that a lot of us are running around thinking that there's no consequences to our actions. And we wonder why we're not growing. And one of the greatest ways to fail with wisdom is to learn to accept the consequences. Remember, this whole series is about not acting like a fool. And I think one of the foolish things that we can do is believe that somehow the decisions and the choices that we make are consequence free. Because they're not. Your words have consequences. Your actions have consequences. Your thoughts have consequences. Everything about us has a consequence. And so I just want to encourage us today. We've got to learn to accept the consequences. And here's the last thing. When it comes to failing with wisdom, we have to accept his love and forgiveness. We have to accept his love and forgiveness. John chapter eight tells this beautiful story about a woman caught in the act of adultery. We'll start in verse two. It says, early in the morning he came again to the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, I just wanna pause here for just a second, and I wanna, I wanna load up this story. Because I think many times what we can do is we can read a story like this in the Bible, and we make it, we make it super vanilla. 
like we, we tend to, I want to say some strong words, we tend to remove the dirty from it. We tend to extract the grit of a story like this. Truthfully speaking, I think many of us, when we read stories like this in the Bible, we try to strip away the humanity from it. As if, as if this was just cut and dry. This was real life, a, a real situation. So when the Bible says that a woman was caught in the act of adultery and brought before Jesus, it means that these scribes and Pharisees were searching for this woman. They had known long enough that this woman was doing what she was doing. And they didn't care about the woman, they cared about catching Jesus. They cared about trapping him. So they had no care for this woman who was going through the things that she was going through in order to put her in the position where this was a repeated lifestyle choice. And so she's caught And in the temple, Jesus is teaching and he's being with people and all of a sudden, this horde of people come in and they throw this woman in front of him. Caught in the act of adultery. And man, verse five, they go after her straight and fast. Now in the law of Moses, it's commanded us to stone such women. So right here, These guys are full well ready and in the position to engage upon a disciplinary measure upon this woman's life. They have no knowledge of her, no understanding of her, no empathy towards her. And they still didn't care about her. And here's how we know that. They go, so what do you say? This they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. So Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. I wanna know what he was writing. Or was he just drawing a smiley face? I don't know. And they continued to ask him. They continued. So I want you to get this picture. Jesus has bent down and he's writing whatever he's writing in the ground and they continued to ask him. So. I think it's safe to assume and fair to realize that he was ignoring them. I love that. It's just ignoring him, ignoring him. They continue to ask him, and finally he stood up and he said to them, and this is where Jesus is like, microphone drop savage. He says, hey, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. This is what he says. He says, Whoever has no failure in their life, feel free to toss the first stone. Watch what happens. And once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. Actually, at that moment, I think he drew a microphone. (laughs) On the ground, dropped. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Now I want you to see this picture. You have two people left. You have the total picture of perfection. Standing before the epitome of brokenness. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now on, sin no more. This is probably one of the strongest pictures of what it means to accept the love and the forgiveness of Christ. See, the truth is is that Jesus authored something in this moment that many of us have yet to receive today. And that is a perfect love and a perfect forgiveness. Is this a scripture that is licensed to keep on doing what it is that we're caught up in? No, because he says to her, go and sin no more. But I just wonder if her ability to overcome was now resting not in her own willpower, but in a love and forgiveness that was strong enough to start to bring correction and change and hope and newness to her soul. And I wonder if today, wherever you're joining in from, if you've accepted that love and forgiveness. 
because I just want to go on record to say this. It is the most powerful love that you will ever come encounter with. The truth is, is there's not a love in this world that can give you what Jesus can give you. There is not a vice in this world that can give you what Jesus can give you. There is not a person in this world that can give you what Jesus can give you. There is not a way to do things in life that will give you what Jesus can give you. I just need us to know today that Jesus is the ultimate gift. And if you're gonna fail with wisdom, if I'm gonna fail with wisdom, I need us to understand that we gotta fail with Jesus in our quarter. So today, I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what's in your heart and in your head or the situation that is in front of you. But this is what I do know, that Jesus is faithful in all of his perfection to love us perfectly. Right where you're at. But the beautiful thing is, is that his perfect love will not leave us there. It propels us forward. So I just want to ask everybody to bow your head and close your eyes in here and wherever you're joining from today online. And we're going to pray a prayer. It's a simple prayer. It's a prayer that simply says, Jesus, I'm giving you my life so that you will do your renovation work in it. Change things, make things new, do something new in me and start building me into the person that you've called me to be. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, Come on, would you just repeat this after me? Everybody say, Jesus, I'm giving you everything. I'm giving you my past. I'm giving you my right now. And I'm putting my future in your hands. And I'm sorry for doing it my way. And right now, I'm turning from my way. And I'm following your way. Today, I'm accepting your love and forgiveness in my life, in Jesus' mighty name.